Welcome back, everybody. In this next lesson, what we'll be talking about um, is a topic that is often interesting to those who are studying finance, the stock market. And the stock market is, at its most simple, a system that we use for trading our interests in public corporations, which we discussed in the last lecture. Now, trading in equities um, can happen in a couple of different ways. You can either have it conducted via a centralized formal auction at an exchange, or they can be ex uh, <laughs> in exchanged between participants informally through a dealer network, what's sometimes called OTC trading or over-the-counter trading. Now, unofficial markets for equities have existed for a long time, at least dating back to the Roman Republic period, where shares in the Societates Publicanorum were believed to have been traded outside the temple of Castor and Pollux. It's worth noting that these kinds of informal dealer networks have always been fairly important. Uh, they encourage innovation among the formal exchanges, uh, and they are often able to operate in areas where uh, traditionally large centralized or uh, operations might simply not be possible. An interesting example of that, can, uh, it was detailed in Reuters back in 2009 uh, when they were able to <clears throat> visit the pirate stock exchange in the village of Hadrahire in Somalia, uh, where they actually found that people were able to sell and raise equity capital in piracy missions that would be conducted in the Gulf of Aden. But the idea of a stock exchange, uh, despite being fairly old, uh, did take a significant evolutionary step uh, in the era of the export in the exploration age, in particular in the Low Countries or the Baspai in northwestern Europe, and what are today known as the Netherlands and Belgium. Now, a lot of this trading had originally uh, been focused in this area because location-wise, the Baspai formed a confluence of endpoints for a number of individual trade routes. There were Mediterranean trade routes coming up through the Bay of Biscay, up to through the English Channel to trade with England uh, and the Baspais. You also had the Hanseatic League active throughout the Baltic and North Seas, whose end point of trade found its way to the same location. So as a confluence of major trade routes, what we saw are commercial centers springing up in these areas where traders would ultimately want to meet in order to transact and settle up accounts. The town of Bergs was one of the first areas uh, where this started to really take off. Uh, by roughly 1400, um, there had been an organized money market beginning to form in the square outside of a popular inn known as Terbeus, uh, which ultimately became the root word for bourse, uh, what we would recognize as an exchange in English. Uh, now, unfortunately for the town of Bergs, by 1400, uh, it had its reattachment to the sea, which had occurred during a large flash flood, uh, ultimately had silted back over. It also didn't help that Bregs had uh, participated in a failed rebellion against the local Habsburg emperors, uh, and as a result, its security as a financial center uh, didn't last. And ultimately, trading moved to uh, the city of Antwerp, which still had uh, <clears throat> some access and was a little bit safer politically than the city of Bergs. Now, Antwerp itself opened a formal exchange in 1531 uh, and activity continued to concentrate there for the next couple of, uh, the next two generations roughly uh, until <laughs> Spanish troops ultimately sacked the city uh, in 1574. None, uh, nonetheless, despite these repeated failures of financial centers in this region, the area continued to remain geographically important. And thus, rather than simply seeing uh, the financial centers dispersed to other regions, we see it simply moving to a safer location uh, within the Low Countries, this time at the mouth of the Amstel River at the town of Amsterdam. Now, once the, the Dutch had managed to free themselves uh, from the Spanish Empire and began to finance their own exploration age corporation, the Dutch East India Company, trading in the shares of the Dutch East India Company, which were concentrated in Amsterdam, helped the idea of the stock exchange to take on a whole new life. As opposed to simply being a financial market for well-connected merchants, now the stock exchange was starting to become a public facility where individual investors were able to buy and sell their interests. Now, of course, there were a limited amount of space to deal with uh, when it came to share trading. Anecdotally, we hear stories of people flooding the bridges in Amsterdam, trying to get a view of Dutch East India ships coming into port to see whether they were sitting high or low in the water. And the shoving matches on the bridge for a better view, resulting in people falling into the waters and ultimately drowning. After a few of these incidences, the city decided that it would be safer to simply dedicate a space for the trading of financial securities 
and dedicated a building at Five Billsplein to act as the Amsterdam Buchs, later to become the Amsterdam Stock Exchange, today part of the Euronext network. Now, of course, space within this building was still limited. Remember that within the first six months of its operation, the Dutch East India Company had 10,000 shareholders. And it would have been pretty spectacular to construct a building that could carefully house so many people in, uh, <clears throat> engaged in sort of a difficult speculative activity. So suffice to say that over time, what we saw were the development of agents and brokers who would trade on behalf of investors uh, <clears throat> who could not obviously spend all of their time listening to all of the various rumors that were circulating on the exchange floor. Instead, what they did was they centralized the trading activities into these various brokers, because the brokers would be able to spend their entire day at the exchange, listening to news of what may be happening abroad, and, and understanding the dynamics of who was needing to buy and who was needing to sell. So today, their core functions of a broker are pretty similar. They supply information, they route trading, and they net transactions between <laughs> investors. Now, in the early years, governments tended to take a fairly suspicious view of stock exchanges, seeing them as being rife centers for speculation, <clears throat> and they often tried to pass laws that inhibited certain types of complex transactions. Nonetheless, what we do see during these early years are the brokers developed their own internal codes of governance that allows them to manage these kinds of sophisticated bilateral transactions, which helps to give birth to the kinds of regulatory organizations among brokers that persist to this day. Now, some of the things which became fairly common quickly uh, in the early days of the Amsterdam Stock Exchange included the idea of borrowing money from your broker uh, to be able to buy more shares. This helped people necessarily who didn't have cash available when there was a buying opportunity, uh, but it also gave rise to a, a particular class of leveraged speculation, which would regularly borrow money from a broker uh, with the intention of simply leveraging their returns. <clears throat> so margin trading has been with us for some time, and it's worth understanding a little bit of the basics of it because it has such an important role to play in the operation of markets today and over the last 400 years. Margin trading is fairly straightforward. You borrow a certain amount of money from your broker. The, you, you invest the total sum of your own money and the broker's money into your securities position. But then any gains or losses earned on that position are absorbed entirely by the <clears throat> borrower. In other words, the, the broker, the lender itself, does not participate in any profits you might earn on the upside, but nor are they expecting to participate in any losses on the downside. And usually what that means is that they'll maintain what is called a <clears throat> sufficient margin requirement. A margin requirement is the basic level of equity that they require that an investor have on hand to absorb any potential losses. In other words, the money that's invested in these kinds of positions necessarily needs to be sufficient to compensate, to, to compensate the <laughs> uh, lender for its risk, but also to protect the lender from potential losses. If a stock price were to drop significantly after a leveraged position had been taken in, what we might see is that the <laughs> investor's own capital could very rapidly erode due to the multiplicative effect of leverage. And so as the investor's own equity begins to rapidly erode and approaches the, or the value of the position begins to approach the size of the lender's debt, the lender may initiate what's called a margin call, which effectively means that they will immediately call the loan uh, that has been taken out by the investor. If they need to sell off securities um, that are underlaying that position in order to meet that margin call, then they will. These types of loans made by brokers are what is called a call loan, uh, simply because the full payment can be demanded at any time. And as we'll see, this plays also a significant role in many stock market bubbles. Another feature of um, <laughs> stock markets that it persists to this day is the notion of short selling. It developed very early on, sometime before 1610 at least, and involved borrowing shares from a broker that belonged to another long-term investor. The idea is fairly straightforward and familiar to most people. You, of course, want to buy low and sell high. What a short seller does is complete that transaction in reverse order, sell high, and then buy low afterwards. The notion here is that as shares may be particularly overpriced and a short seller might be speculating or anticipating uh, that there will be some kind of reduction in price, allowing them to buy the shares back in the future uh, and thus repay the loan, which is denominated not in currency, but in shares. <clears throat> 
Now, of course, there are concerns that people have right away. The idea that I would lend shares to someone as a broker that allowed them to sell those shares in the market and then take profits from it might leave me as the broker who had lent out the shares in a difficult position should that person simply choose to abscond with the proceeds. So in the modern world, short sellers are required to keep all of the proceeds of that short sale plus additional margin in the broker's account until such time as the, short, uh, the position has been closed out by purchasing the shares in the market and repaying that debt. Now, sometimes we'll see short sellers getting a bit of a bad rap despite the fact that they're economically valuable and pro uh, provide markets with liquidity when prices are rising rapidly, they also serve effectively as a check on speculation on the upside where prices might rise to unsustainable or dramatically high levels that aren't justified by the earnings capacity of a firm. In that sense, short sellers can act as a check uh, on speculative bubbles, to, <clears throat> at least when they can detect them. Now, <clears throat> to get an idea of what can happen in a market that doesn't have short sellers, we don't have to look much further than the Saudi Arabian stock market bubble from 2004 to 2006. At the link here below to trading economics, you can adjust the graph to show you uh, what the stock market bubble looks like. The way that this formed in Saudi Arabia is that there was no short selling allowed. And during this particular period, astonishingly high oil profits were flowing into the kingdom's coffers and were being quickly reinvested into construction and telecom. So unsurprisingly, banks, telcos, construction, and of course, oil companies were doing particularly well in that market. However, the prices wildly rose by a factor of eight over just two years, effectively arguing that all companies in Saudi Arabia were eight times more valuable than they had been just two years before. Unsurprisingly, that sort of price was unsustainably high. And when people tried to sell, there were simply no investors willing to take those shares off their hands. Had, unsurprisingly, after that, the market immediately collapsed uh, very, very fe uh, fiercely over the next couple of weeks, as there was simply no one willing to come into market to buy. The idea is not that short sellers could have prevented the collapse, but that short sellers would have prevented the bubble from forming in the first place had they been allowed to borrow overpriced shares and sell them in the market, sending at least some signal to potential speculators that there is not an unlimited amount of upside available. Finally, we have to consider the role of market makers, another kind of intermediary that we see emerging in the early years of the Amsterdam Stock Exchange. By the 1630s, uh, there were two brothers in uh, operating at the Amsterdam Exchange, Jan and Christoffel Raffoum, uh, who had decided to act as specialists, running auctions where they would both buy and sell uh, shares of various securities uh, <clears throat> from anyone who wanted to buy or sell at any point in time. These market makers effectively were trying to intermediate trades over time, effectively buying up shares when they were being forced sold into the market and then selling them off uh, at higher prices once markets had <clears throat> begun to earn a little bit of a more stable footing. Uh, but in general, the market makers business today is not so much one of speculating on the direction of the market, so much as helping to connect buyers and sellers. When you're buying and selling, uh, investments between uh, participants in a stock market, usually your counterparty is not the other person who is looking to buy and hold this investment, but rather a market maker who will attempt to buy it at a fairly cheap price and hold it in inventory for a short period of time before reselling it on to someone else. Now, lest we think that market makers are simply financial vampires getting in the middle of transactions, it's worth noting that market makers generally lose on information-based trading <clears throat> when people suspect there's something wrong with a company, they'll often sell it, and the market makers are in a position of needing to buy it. On the other hand, when everybody suspects something good about a firm and they all want to buy, it's the market makers who are seeing their inventories drawn down. Now, they might quickly adjust their prices to try to bring their target levels of inventory uh, or bring their inventory back to target level. But nonetheless, what we find is that when new information enters the market, it tends to be the market makers that lose, even if they are picking up the pennies on the, big at, the bid ask spread in every transaction that we make.